Hello everyone, this is Jan Chromi and together we will continue the course Interdisciplinary Approaches to Language and its Use. This is the second out of the four presentations which are devoted to the acquisition of words. We concluded the last presentation with this list of factors which might influence the acquisition of words. We already discussed the innate abilities in general. In this presentation, we will briefly address the role of input, and then we will focus on two principles which have been proposed as necessary for word learning, and these are the whole object bias and mutual exclusivity assumption. Let's start with the role of the input. As we said before, we have certain innate abilities which allow us to learn a language. On the other hand, it is clear that the input the child gets is extremely important for what it learns and how fast. We discussed the feral children and deaf people who are without any input for several years, and we came to the conclusion that this had a severe impact for their language learning. Now we will narrow the question a little bit and we will focus on how much input needs a child to learn a word. The key term which we will use here is mapping between meaning and form. In the input, the child hears the form of the word, but to acquire it, it needs to map this form to its correct meaning. This is not a straightforward thing, obviously. One possible way how the children may map the form to the meaning is via the so-called ostensive naming. Ostensive naming is a term which stands for a situation when people point to an entity and say its name. In other words, you would be using ostensive naming if you would point at a doll and say doll or this is a doll or something similar. This may be really helpful, but the problem is that most of the words are not acquired this way. We may use ostensive naming from time to time, and some people use it more than others in communication with children. However, the child learns most words in non-ostensive contexts. Other possibility, which has received quite a lot of attention, is fast mapping. This term refers to an ability to associate a meaning with a form based on just one or very few encounters. Fast mapping was introduced by Susan Carey and Elsa Bartlett. They ran an experiment with three-year-olds. They presented the children an olive and a red plate. Then they asked them, bring me the chromium one, not the red one. In most cases, children brought the correct plate. After one week, they tested the children on the word chromium. More than half of them knew what the word means. The important thing was that the children heard the form chromium only once and they were able to map it correctly to its meaning. We'll return to fast mapping in a special presentation which will present you the research by Laurie Markson and Paul Bloom in detail. It is clear that the existence of fast mapping is a very important ability. It seems that children do not need that much input to learn a word. However, one can say that word, word learning is actually a gradual process. To master the meaning and the correct use of the word, one needs to have multiple encounters with the word and ideally in diverse contexts. In other words, it would be quite harsh to say that fast mapping is the main and sole principle of for word learning. Before a few slides, we mentioned ostensive naming as a possible way how to learn a word. In a study by Emma Axelson, Kirsten Churchley and Jessica Horst, it was tested how ostensive naming actually works in word learning. They ran an experiment with 24 month olds and they found that illumination of the target object and covering of other objects in the scene actually improved the word learning in comparison with a situation in which the children were given a social pragmatic cue such as pointing. 
They thus conclude that what is the most important thing on ostensive naming is drawing the attention to the target object. Now, let's turn our attention to the whole object bias. To illustrate the point, teachers and textbook authors typically use the so-called indeterminacy of translation problem, which was posited by the philosopher Villard Quine. Quine illustrates it on a, on a clear example. You may imagine that you are a guest of some indigenous community with which you do not share a mutual language. You are on a grassland and suddenly a rabbit runs just past you. One of the people shouts Gavagai and points at the rabbit. What can you tell about the meaning of the word Gavagai? From a logical point of view, the word can have infinite meanings. It can mean a rabbit, but it can also mean the rabbit is fast, it can mean sneaky creature, or it can mean the fur is white as snow, and so on. This presents an interesting philosophical problem. However, from the point of view of language acquisition, it is important that children do not typically think about all the logically possible meanings, but they have a whole object bias. The whole object bias lies in the assumption that a, that a word refers to a whole object and not to its other aspects such as its color, shape, part and so on. This bias or tendency is very well established by re, uh, various experiments. In the literature, we may find different explanations of this principle. One of them is that we are predisposed to see the world as consisting of various objects and that objects are thus the most salient entities to us. The last principle I would like to focus on in this presentation is the so-called mutual exclusivity assumption. This is an idea that children tend to think words do not overlap in their meanings. This assumption was introduced in the study by Alan Markman and Gwen Wachtel in 1988. They ran experiments with three-year-olds. In one of them, children saw two objects. One was known, such as banana, and other unknown. The children were told, show me the, and then a pseudo word followed, which was always some nonsense syllable. Interestingly, the children showed a significant tendency to choose the unknown object as the referent of the pseudo word. In another experiment, they used only one, one object, which was known by the children, such as the banana. In this case, the children had a tendency to understand the pseudo word as a name for a part of the object. However, the idea of the mutual exclusivity assumption was later contested. In their study, Susan Savage and Terry Kit von Kau ran experiments on three to five year olds. They used two different words as names for one object and they found that around the half of the children actually accepted both words as synonyms. The other half accepted only the name they heard first. This may serve as an argument that the mutual exclusivity assumption can be overridden by other factors. This makes much sense also because there are many synonyms in every language. Moreover, the mutual exclusivity assumption does not take into account early bilinguals who normally acquire and use translation equivalents. Before we will conclude this presentation, I have two reading tips for you. First, I would like to recommend you a brilliant book, How Children Learn the Meanings of Words by Paul Bloom. Bloom considers various aspects of word learning in a great depth. He also devotes a part of the book to the whole object assumption, so if you would be interested in this topic, you may find more information in this book. The second text I would like to recommend to you is the study by Meredith Rowe, which analyzes various quantitative and qualitative aspects of the caregiver input and its influence on the child's vocabulary skills across early development. This is a fascinating topic which we sadly do not have time to focus on here. 
But if the if it interests you, you know where to look for information now. That is all from me now. See you next time.